climate change and these sea level things, I think for me, it's, and a lot of people, it's really hard to figure out how that affects you personally. You know, it's sort of this global thing. And I don't, I don't know that Jamaica and people in Jamaica really have their head around that yet. Um, but obviously we're going to be affected. You know, small island developing states, you know, are on the forefront of the brunt of what's going to happen. The earth is reheating themselves up. That everybody knows, but nobody wants to accept it. When it's reheating, the ice poles at the end melts, the glaciers melt, and what happens? The water rises, and it affects people like this small island, like this Prale, and Mahe, and other islands in, everywhere and around the world. Um, we have experienced already, because of the hurricane in 2004 and 2005, that climate change is not really far from our beds. We woke up one morning and everything is beautiful, and the next morning you can say 85% of what you know is gone. So climate change and its impact for Grenadians is very real, is very serious, and persons are more aware of what we can do together to make a change. here, more, more or less here. That was a road. That was uh, detoured something like 22 years ago. And now it's no more on the coastal area. We have challenges in reference to, for example, climate change, which is posing a lot of problems along the coast, whereby we are experiencing, uh, like most of the small island states, um, sea level rise impacts where we have coastal erosion, degradation of the coastlines, and also uh, in, uh, degradation and uh, bleaching of the coral reef systems. Reefs are critically important to protecting islands, um, especially in, you know, if you have climate change, sea level rise and things like that. As storms become more severe, reefs are absolutely crucial. And, uh, you know, unfortunately it's no secret that Jamaican reefs are some of the most devastated uh, on the planet. Some of the changes that are happening in the environment are so slow that because we do not see the impacts every day, we feel that nothing is happening. But we have opportunities in the area of really protecting the reefs, because they are the first barrier against any tidal reef that we can... Reefs do several things. Um, the, the simplest way to think about it is that it's one of three main ecosystems that you find in coastal zones. You find reefs, you find seagrass beds, and you find mangrove habitats. And they are... they're all connected. One of the things I like to tell students is that everything is connected so that you can't affect one without affecting the other. So the mangrove swamp, as, although it may appear to be a dirty, mucky place, it's actually protecting the reef from coastal runoff and it acts like a sponge because the reef needs certain conditions in which to thrive. Reefs need warm, clear, salty water. So a mangrove swamp now is stopping the fresh water from, when it rains heavily, it's stopping the fresh water and all the silt from running offshore and, and, and swamping the reef. The reef in turn is protecting the seagrass beds and the mangroves from heavy wave energies. And then there are animals in all habitats which spend different parts of their life cycles in different specific habitats. So you won't find lobster or certain species of fish without having a, a mangrove forest, a mangrove habitat nearby.
In regards to potential solutions to a problem of devastated reefs, you know, I, I don't know that there's one solution, um, but there are potential solutions and things that we're trying here that seem to be working fairly well. Coral nurseries are basically an effort to, to facilitate the rapid growth of large numbers of specific types, kinds, species of corals. We, basically what we have are fishing lines in the water, buoyed on, on both sides, and uh, you take nubbins of the coral that's already there, and you tie them onto these lines. And so over the course of six months, a nubbin will go from a little piece to about eight, 10 inches long. And then at that point, we take them out and, and tie them to the reef. And they grow. It's amazing. We've planted over 4,000 pieces of coral now in the past three years, roughly. You know, we're planting new coral. The fish are there, they're taking care of it, but also the fish are taking care of the coral that is still there and that's getting healthier. And so it's a symbiotic relationship. The whole climate change argument calls for intervention at several levels, at international, national, regional, local levels. And it's, I think it's a case of each individual doing what they can do at their level to make the whole thing work. Yes, if we are busy putting these out and somebody somewhere else is still busy burning fossil fuels and producing carbon dioxide and increasing acidification levels in the water and all that, then perhaps we're working in vain. But given the rate at which thing, habitats like these can recover, if you stop all the CO2 production and so on and you're still not putting out habitats that will facilitate the, the local scale growth of things, then again, you're not doing all that you could. And it, it, it does take an intervention at several levels. And if that could be, if you could engage that and make that happen, then yes, I would be fully optimistic instead of being just partially optimistic. <laughs>